Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Let us pray. Our Father, we have entered into a new year with COVID. We are thankful that it did not catch you by surprise. Nothing can, nothing will. There was a fear that came with this, but you said in your word, fear not, for I am with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Keep your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter what happens, we must keep our faith in Jesus. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. I will hold, uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Let's all stand this morning. Isn't the Lord good today? It's good to be back in the house of the Lord. It's good to have Jimmy back with us this morning. Looking good back there. Huh? Oh, and Gam's back. Yay! <laughs> good to have everybody back this morning. I want you to just take a minute. I know we had some time to say hello, but I see some new faces in the house. So if you see somebody that you didn't get to say hello to, go give, go give somebody a, a hug or a handshake. Welcome, welcome them to a live church. So good to have you all today.
you took us from that miry clay and set our feet upon the solid rock. Thank you, Lord.
thank you, Jesus, that you are greater. You are greater than any need. You are greater than any disease, dear Father, that you are our healer. We just declare that over our body today, that you are our healer, you are our strength, dear God. We bless your name, Father. Thank you, Lord, because you are greater. You're so much greater. You're so much greater. Thank you, Jesus. Because our God is greater. My God is stronger. God, you are high. Awesome in power, my God, my God. song we could ever sing.
Heavenly Father, I love you with all my heart. Father, we come together inside of this place to hear your word. Father, we come together as the body of Christ to strengthen each other, to equip each other, to encourage each other, and to correct each other, Lord God. Father, we are your body, and we're thankful that you cared so much about your body that you were willing to die for us. And Father, we pledge that you're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we give you not part of our lives, but all of our lives. And I'm so thankful, so thankful that all of our sins have been washed clean. That upon us confessing our sins and repenting and walking away from those things, you are more than willing to cast as far as the east to the west all of our transgressions. I love you, Father, for that. Thank you, Jesus. We praise your name. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Everybody tell me that God's good. God's good. And all the time. All the time. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> it's been too long, y'all. It's been too long. God is good. God is good. And all the time. I got like 70% of you. I'm going to leave it right there. That's, that's where I'm going to leave it. That, you know, every church I've ever been to, they always know this. I grew up saying it my entire life, and it, it, it's, so, it's so true. It reigns true. But I want to welcome everybody. We have some new people. I love our church. I love our band. I especially love our piano player. I think she's attractive, you know, and so if you... <laughs> she is my wife, if you're concerned with anything. I, I, I once made a joke one time for the pulpit that I was sleeping with our music director, and true story, we had people leave the church. <laughs> but it's okay. I don't, I'm not making the joke no more. It's all right. It's all right. I, I just really like her a whole lot. A lot of people from the north are coming down to the south. I don't know if you've noticed. Several of y'all, I talked to you this morning. Y'all are snowbirds or you're different people who's moving from the north. I want to welcome you to the south. Yeah, and so there's a lot of people here that are kind of concerned with this. 
Yeah, yeah. Have you ever heard all this? It's like all, the, all these northern people are moving south, and they're going to try to turn the south into the north. I, I want you to know that so far, that hasn't really been the case. We've been doing pretty good. Most of them that I've talked to has pretty much the same viewpoints that we do. So I want to encourage everybody to embrace them, but keep your eye on them. Okay? <laughs> That's it. I just, I'm going to need I'm going to need you to do that. You know, we can't trust them, but so far, let's be real honest. Here we go. Here we go. But anyways, we got a lot of things going on. Real quick before I jump in my message, all the men, I want to invite you to the men's conference that we're going to in Warner Robins. It's at the Warner Robins Assemblies of God. It's about an hour and a half from here. Uh, you should have got a flyer when you're coming in. The cost to go is $100. Now, that includes your hotel room. Yes, you will be sharing a room with somebody, but it includes your hotel room and it includes your conference costs. So if you're interested in going to that, I need you to let me know ASAP and have your money turned in, I believe, by the 27th. I believe that's when Sunday the 27th or 26th, I don't remember which one's the Sunday, that you would turn your money in for that so that we could go. Outside of that, we got, we got some stuff going on. We got uh, Super Bowl Sundays coming up. So for all y'all football fans, we give you one Sunday. Okay, because, you know, some people are fans and some people aren't. To wear your team apparel. You can wear your favorite team apparel or you can wear team apparel that's playing in the Super Bowl. I don't really care. But it's going to be a sports theme service. My father, Dr. Stephen Darnell, will be coming and he'll be speaking for us. And we always love to have my dad preach because he's just so much better than me. And I get encouraged every single time I hear him. But, but he'll be here and so I'm excited about that. Uh, me and Starla are going to leave immediately after that because we are going out on an anniversary trip. We haven't gone anywhere in a couple of years by ourselves, so mom and dad's going to keep the kids and we're going to disappear for a week. So if you call me during that week, I don't care. <laughs> just going just to let you know, you know, it, it kind of is what it is. I'm going to put you off somebody else. Last thing, church work day. Uh, we have a lot of things that I want to get ready for the year. We got some stuff we just need to clean up. We need to touch up paint. We have to dig a trench and get the sign working properly. We got to put some fences around the uh, AC units on the side. The insurance company is requiring a couple of things. And then we just have to organize and get ready. Because I believe that this year the Lord is going to allow us to become who we were meant to be. Amen. Amen. Or at least start the journey of becoming. That's what I'm going for this year. And so I want you guys to get ready for all of that. Now here's what's happened to me over the past few weeks. Most of you are aware, are aware because it's happened to you too. I have spent way too much time in my house the past couple weeks. I mean, we're all trying to be responsible, right? We, there's a lot of us who tested positive. We went through this whole thing. And so we, we sheltered in place. I don't know whatever you want to call it. You know, we spent our time. Uh, and, and I don't know if you are, but I'm not a stay-at-home person. Like, my wife's worse than I am. Like, she does not want to stay inside all the time. You get to going crazy. In the beginning, it's okay. Like, you know, Calvin, you're like, it's okay because I have, like, some, some movies that I've been wanting to watch, you know. So I'm going to pull up these different apps we have, and I want to stream a couple movies. I want to see. i got a few TV shows I need to catch up on. And the kids were kind of excited because the kids were like, oh, man, we just got a new PlayStation, and we want to play our new games. And Esther got a bunch of Barbies, and so she's going to play. Her. So we're good until, like, day three. Yeah. After day three, I'm done. Like, I don't know about how you guys work. I'm telling you, we are absolutely done. And so I started paying attention to the kids. I don't know if you do this. I started paying attention to the kids. And the problem is that we had no plans or objectives whatsoever. It was, you just have to stay at home. See, when they had the whole 14 days to slow the curve and all this kind of stuff, me and Starla had a plan for those 14 days. Nobody was sick. We went to Sherwin-Williams and we were painted our whole house. Our whole house, we did on 14 days. So I had something to do. This time we had nothing to do. And so everything's going on, and I'm watching the kids, and, and here's how their days kind of went. Like they would wake up and never take their pajamas off. But they're going to wake up, and they're like, oh, I'm wrong with some breakfast. So they're running, and they get some breakfast, and then they immediately start playing video games. Same thing every day. They play video games until they're tired of it, and they're like, I'm sick of this. And so then they're going to go outside, and they're going to jump on the trampoline. After they jump on the trampoline, they're like, I'm sick of this. I want a snack. They go inside, they're like, I'm not even hungry, you know, because they've been eating snacks all day. And so you got this going on. We're running out of snacks. And, and then so at the end of the day, after they have done whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted to do it, I asked them, I said, hey, kids, how was your day today? And Judah looks at me and says, uh, you know, it was okay, but I'm really bored, Dad. You know, like, it, it, was just, it was just okay. But I'm like, son, 
You did whatever you wanted, whenever you wanted to do it. And then I'm reminded in that moment that you can do whatever you want to do and still be unhappy. And there's just a truth to that 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 showed me. And so I began thinking upon the scripture that we all know so well. It's Proverbs 29, 18. And it says, where there is no vision, the people what? But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Something about the rule, the order to it all that, that, that brings happiness to it all. And so here's what happened. I just went down this journey, and I'm going to go down it with you this morning. I began to think of God's people, when I mean the Israelites, when I'm saying God's people, and they were escaping Egyptian captivity, and they would end up wandering in the wilderness. So I'm just going to real quick go through the story and how it all kind of happened and show you what the Lord showed me in all of it. I was really interested in the way that they first got to Egypt. I think sometimes we forget this, the way that they ended up inside of Egypt. Joseph, whose father's name is Jacob. You're close, bro. I mean, one brother off. You know what I'm saying? So we had Joseph, whose father's name was Jacob, and his brothers hated him. His brothers hated him because he was his father's favorite son. He was given this special multicolored coat. We know the story. The brothers get jealous. So what do the brothers decide to do? Let's throw our brother into a pit. Right? The pits are here this morning. I want to welcome you guys. Thank you for being here. That made me think of that. Anyways, and so they throw him into this pit, right? And they decide they don't really want to do that. They see some, so they sell him to slavery. You guys are with me. They sell him to slavery. So he goes into slavery, and what you're going to discover is over a course of events, a series of ups and downs, he ends up in prison two times, right? And so he's in prison for the second time. Pharaoh then has a set of dreams. He has two different dreams. He goes to his advisors, to his magicians, to his astrologers, all the different people that he would go to for advice in this, and none of them can interpret the dreams, right? Like, none of them can interpret the dream. But Pharaoh has a cupbearer. The cupbearer says, hey, there's this guy named Joseph. When I was in prison, because you put me there, Pharaoh, but when I was in prison, I was in there with a the baker, and we both had dreams. This guy named Joseph, who knows God, comes in here and interprets our dreams, and everything he said came true. So why don't we bring Joseph in? Pharaoh says, good idea. Send Joseph to him. They get Joseph ready. He goes from the prison to the palace. He shows up in there, and he's ready to interpret the dream. And it gets real interesting to me because not only did Joseph interpret the dream, and he did. Remember, he goes to Pharaoh and says, here's what's going to happen. This is what your dream means. They're one and the same. You're going to have seven years of plenty and seven years of you guys are good, man. My Bible scholars up in here. All right? And so he goes to him, and then Joseph not only interprets his dreams, but he follows that up with a plan. I think that's what we miss a lot when we read through this. We get stuck on the fact that he interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, but never forget the fact that not only did he interpret the dreams, but he gave Pharaoh a plan of execution of how you're going to do this. Genesis 41, starting in verse 33. It says, and now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of the Egyptian over the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine. That will come. Everybody say, will come. All right. That will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. The famine's coming. We don't want the country to be ruined by the famine. And so why does Joseph not just interpret the dream? That's all he was asked to do, right? Why didn't he stop there? I think Joseph understands, as well as most of us understand, that a dream without a plan is just a dream. I've never wished something into existence. Like, that there has to be something that you follow through. Pharaoh did not need someone to come tell him he had a problem. <laughs> he had these dreams. These dreams were troubling him. He was asking everybody he knew. Can you tell me what these dreams mean? Nobody can answer him. Pharaoh knew that he had a problem, and what he needed was to partner with somebody that had a solution. This is what he needed. 
And, and so verse 37 says, after he presented this, verse 37, the plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. It was good to everybody. This is a good plan. Pharaoh is then going to respond to what Joseph recommends by saying this in verse 39. Then, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is none, no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. How many of his people? All my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Pharaoh senses that God had given Joseph an interpretation and a plan. This guy is the man with the plan. So what Pharaoh does is he then subjects all of his people and himself. Everybody say himself. Yeah. All his people and himself to this plan. He says, and this is what got me, guys. You guys said all too because you heard it. Only with respect to the throne am I greater than you. In other words, the only reason that I'm going to be seen as greater in the people's eyes is because of the throne that I possess. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer my position. I'm going to offer my income. I'm going to offer my resources. I'm going to offer my power to your plan. I'm going to give all this to you. And why does he do that? Because where there is no vision, and he knew it, I can't afford for the people to perish. So I must submit myself and all that I have influence over to the plan. And it's amazing to me. The choice seems to be either I can follow God's plan or I can perish. That's a harsh way of saying it. But it seems to be the case that this is how this works. Pharaoh could have responded however Pharaoh wanted to respond. He's the king. He's in charge. Pharaoh can do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it. Are you with me? He can do this. But he understands that if I just do whatever I feel like doing, then that normally leads me to a result that I don't enjoy. Judah said, I don't know, Dad. I didn't really have that good of a day. I did everything I wanted to do, but I'm bored. He didn't like the result. The result wasn't enjoyed. Joseph is put in charge, uh, the famine hits, and all of a sudden Egypt is the only country prepared. Of all the surrounding places, we discover this is the only place that's prepared. All the, the surrounding nations are then going to be coming to Egypt to buy grain, to buy corn, and to buy these different things that they had stored up. And Egypt is going to become wealthy and become one of the most significant superpowers of its time. Why? Because Pharaoh submitted himself to God's plan on Joseph's life. Isn't that amazing? You don't ever think about this. How did Egypt become a superpower? Because Pharaoh submitted to the Lord. But Pharaoh was pagan. Yeah, it works for everybody. It, it, it's, it's amazing how these things work. He, he just submitted to this. And so all these things are going to happen. Joseph's put in charge. The famine hits. All of a sudden, Egypt is the only place that prepares. Uh, all, the, all the nations are coming to them, and they're getting wealthy. Joseph's brother then comes, just like Joseph's dreams. You guys remember the story. Joseph's brother is then going to come, and they're going to try to buy food from Joseph. And then Joseph is going to instruct them, I want you to go back. I want you to bring the entire family. I want to move you here with us so we can be taken care of. And that's how the Israelites. Israelites got to Egypt. That's how they got there, okay? Time passes. Joseph is forgotten. He's not thought about anymore. Uh, the Israelites' numbers are increasing. Their political influence is increasing because what you have to understand, the, the Israelites had completely integrated in with the Egyptian culture. They were uh, they, were, they were in their politics. They were, in, they were running stores. They were, they were completely involved. And the problem here is that the Egyptians were beginning to outnumber the homeboys. And these foreigners are seen as a threat now. There's so many of them. If they decide to do an uprising, we can't do anything about it. So what happens? They turn them into slaves. 
This is what they're going to do. The problem is that when they turned them into slaves, every time the Pharaoh would put a stronger uh, punishment, a harsher uh, reality to their lives, their numbers would increase. Why? Because for some strange reasons, the church always seems to progress when we're put in harsh environments. Every single time. It, It always seems to happen. And so time begins to pass. They have been turned into slaves. And then Moses is going to show up on the scene. Moses shows up on the scene. And this is God's man with God's plan. Here we are again. Story's repeating itself. I don't know if you ever look at it this way. And then Moses, Moses, Moses is going to walk up to Pharaoh. And he's going to say the famous words, let my people go. Yeah, yeah, you guys are with me. Let my people go. Eventually... Through a series of plagues, Pharaoh reluctantly lets the people go. He lets them go. They travel an exciting 13-day journey through the desert and through the wilderness. And here they are, and they're standing at the entrance of their promised land. 13 days, guys. 13 days. And they're standing there at the entrance of their promised land. And here we are, Exodus chapter 3, in verse 8. And it says, So I, being God have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land. A land flowing with what? <laughs> Woo! With milk and honey. The home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perserites, Hivites, Jebusites, and all the other ites, it seems like. They're all there. Moses then decides to send out 12 guys are good, man. Twelve spies. And they are to assess the land. And when they come back, here's what they have to say. In Numbers chapter 13, verse 27, they show back up. And it says, they gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does. It, It does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit. Here's the evidence that what you're saying is true. It's there. But the people who live there are powerful, and their cities are fortified. They're very large. This is the problem. In other words, get this, everything that God's man said is true. Everything that the Lord told them is true. The land flows with abundance. The land flows with provision. The land is a fortified and protected land. It is a beautiful place, but... The people are extremely intimidating. They're, they're extremely intimidating. Caleb <clears throat> then steps up. You know, Caleb, okay, shows up on the scene. Caleb was also one of the spies. He stands up in front of all of them and he says, Whoa, whoa, guys, whoa, whoa. We should go and take possession of the land for we can certainly do this. This is what he says. We got this. If you remember, it's going to be Caleb that's one of the only ones, him and Joshua, the only ones from the old crew that's allowed to come into the new land and possess it. Why? Because he believed even back then. And he was willing to go and do it. Right? And so Caleb says, man, we we can do all this. But then in verse 31, it says, but the men who had gone with him said, we can't attack those people. Come on, Caleb. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. So in other words, they spread fear. This is all they did. They just spread it everywhere they could go. So this time, instead of the people submitting themselves to God's plan, they submitted themselves to the fear of what could go wrong. You have to catch it. You have to catch it. The result of not participating in God's plan is 40 years in the wilderness. That's the result of it. Until, right. Until all the people who rejected God's way died off. And a new generation rises up. Here's what I want to submit to you this morning. This is my whole point of my whole sermon. Are you guys ready? It's always more costly not to, not to participate in God's plan than to fight to fulfill it. That's it. No matter how you look at it, no matter how intimidating the people in the land are, no matter how difficult and how much talent that you don't acquire to do what God's asking you to do, no matter what the scenario is painted like, 
There's some insane scenarios in the Bible by which God's victorious. All right? No matter what, it always costs more to not do it than to fight to fulfill what the Lord has on your life. The cost is always greater. A new generation gets behind the plan. We have another man with a plan. They're going to get behind Joshua, and they're able to accomplish what their fathers were afraid to try. They do it in a miraculous way. Everybody thought they're going to go out there, have to go out there and start shooting long shots with the bow and arrow and take out the majority before they got there, and they were real worried about their skills with the swords. What does God tell them to do? First battle, Jericho. Just go march around some walls. Yeah, the last day we're going to do it, we're going to yell. And everything's going to fall. This is ridiculous. But the Lord's plan always takes a level of faith. <laughs> right? It's always going to take this. And so as you read the Bible, I, I discovered that you can just watch as kingdoms rise and fall based upon people's decisions whether or not they submit themselves to God's plan. Kingdoms rise and fall over this, guys. Read 1 Kings, 2 Kings. Go through all this and watch as they come up and go down. Watch as patriarchs, watch as prophets go up and down depending on whether or not they do what the Lord asked them to do or not. Just, just, just watch the results of it. And so as you go through this, Moses dies, Joshua becomes the new leader, and a new generation gets behind this plan, and they fulfill the plan. God's plan, I've discovered, is never fulfilled by one person. This is what we have to get as a body, okay? God's plan is never fulfilled by one person. It's accomplished by the participation of the people. Everybody say the people. Say the people's me. Yeah, us, right? It's always accomplished by the participation of the people. Pharaoh said, I not only subject myself, but all my people, Right? will come under you and do what needs to be done. A new generation gets behind Joshua because they understand the cost of saying no leads to wilderness walking. Mm. So last week, I'm going to jump back to where I was last week if you were here, okay? I began to talk about a, a sermon series. that I don't know if you call it a series. It's a thing I'm preaching. A title, A Church I'd Like to Attend. Everybody say The Church I'd Like to Attend. I have this problem with that title that I gave it. Number one, the church is not something that we attend. It's something that we are. This is problem number one. Because this is what, did you put it up there, Thomas. This is what everybody is looking for. They're looking for this church that I want to go to. That I want to take my kids to. And they never remember the fact that any church can become... What you're looking for if the people are willing to fight for it. They're willing to do what needs to be done. And so we're, we're, we are not looking for a church. We are to become that church. The second problem I have is I'd like. That's the wrong. Fuck, that's cool though. Whatever. You know, it's, 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 it's the church. Everybody say I'd like. The church I'd like to go to. It's, it's I'd like. Um, a church that is everything that you like. It's probably a church that won't mature you. It's a church that will spoil you, get you comfortable, but probably not even have a place they need you. Amen. And so you're going to find this. Ephesians 4.16 is my main scripture with all this, with a church that I would like for us to become. Ephesians 4.16. From him, him being Christ... The whole body, the whole body being the church, our church, from Christ, the church, joined together by every supporting ligament. Joined and held together by every supporting ligament. That's the relationships with the people inside the body. Okay? From Christ, the church, through its relationships, will grow and build itself in love as each part does... Mm. Everybody's involved. Amen. Everybody has part. Everybody has to fight. 
It's, it's every single one of us. And I believe, I'm just my personal opinion, I've been through a lot of different church growth classes. I've been, I've been to a lot of different churches, worked at different ones. Here's what I believe. I believe that this scripture represents church growth God's way more than any other scripture does. I, be, I believe that this does. Today, we most likely see church growth that's going to happen through marketing. It's going to happen through a superstar pastor that everybody listens to his podcast, and he has some sort of clout with him, and he's starting different sites in different places, and they become these, these big church. But what if we had a church that actually built itself up in love as each part does its work? Right? What if we had a church that, that says they're joined and held together by every supporting ligament? What if we actually grabbed hands with each other and we supported each other? When you were down, I'm down. Scripture says, I will rejoice with you and I will mourn with you. That, that we go through all of these ups and downs together, never having to be apart because we understand that we're stronger if we're all working together, not talking about each other. Amen. Come on. Not on y'all on like that thing, Pastor Preacher, all six so and so, she and she on sitting back there. She said what she was wearing, man. I tell you what, her husband, I don't really think he even likes to come. I wouldn't like to come too fast sit beside her. You know, and so all the all the it's not it's not one that talks about each other. The gossip has to go. The talk has to go. All the down. If you can't encourage each other, it says that we build each other up in love. You know, that we encourage each other in the ways of the Lord, right? Amen. Think on things that are true, that are trustworthy, right? Come on. We know the, that these are the things that need to be the focus that what we're going for. I believe that this shows us church growth God's way where it doesn't even matter. Now follow me. Who's preaching that Sunday? It doesn't matter who's the singer that Sunday. It doesn't really matter how fancy the property is. Now, I want a nice property just like everybody else. Come on, let's be honest. But it doesn't matter how fancy the property is, but it's a church who the head is Jesus Christ. This is the head, and this is where we're happening. What he says we do. The head is Jesus Christ. It, it, it's a church that literally supports and strengthens one another that as we are together... Everybody say together. God's kingdom begins to grow as we each do our own part. That's it. As we do, as we do our own part. And I think the attractiveness of a church is not to be found in any individual. But in the unity and the effectiveness of a body that's working together doing its own part. Amen. Like that's impressive to me. I want to come into a place where everybody's on the same page. You know, they're not fighting against each other. They're working towards a common goal. They want to see the lost saved. They want to see the sick healed. I, I want to see the dead raised. I want, to, I, I want to see, I want to see lepr, leprosy. I want, I want to see the blind eyes open. I, I, want, I want to see these things that the Bible talks about happening. That's going to happen when we all get together and on the same page and we're going out. I want to see people coming in off the streets and getting saved. And these are the things I'm wanting. My heart's bleeding for these things, man. Our church needs these things. You know, I, I, don't, I love it when new people come into the church. I love it when they become part of the church. But, but a lot of times it's just another Christian that's transitioning from one place to another place. What I want to see is some brand new folks who don't know Jesus, who cusses in the pool and back here in the seats because they don't even know how to act right. They don't understand Christianese. And we're just going to work through all this with them. Hey, you know. Mm. But, but these are the things that I would want us to become. Because I want when somebody comes in to say, listen, the way y'all work together, the way that y'all care for each other, this is impressive. You know what people really want? They want a family. What people really want is they want to belong. That's what they really want. Deep down inside, relationships. That's why it says that we are the people who are joined and held together by every supporting ligament that grows by building itself up in love. Because the, the core of it all is relationship. This is what they're, they want a relationship with Christ. They want a relationship with the body. And they want that body to then extend itself out and make relationship with the community. And to begin to make an impact on all of that around us. You know what I've discovered is that when you get saved, you are not automatically who God made you to be. Like that's what we want. But that's not the reality of it all. 
He's still working on me. You guys remember that song? Yeah. Yeah. Because there, there, there's a continual sanctification process by which the Lord's doing in your life to make you like him. And this is going on. And so our church, you have to understand, is not fully who it is to become. It isn't. And I ask myself, why does Paul describe the ideal church this way? Why do we grow in love as each part each does its own, uh, as each part, I, I can't say it right, I, it's every person does its own part, you know? Why, why, why does Paul describe it like this? You go to Ephesians 4, in verse 7, it says, but to each one of us, grace, everybody say grace, grace. has been given as Christ apportioned it, Amen. as Christ a portion as Christ assigned it. That is, he gave it to you. We each individually have a grace that has been apportioned to us by Christ. We all have our Christ, our special apportioned grace from Christ. When you become a part of a church and you join hands with each other, you are going to quickly realize that we are not all the same. Yeah, but we're not, man. I'm just going to tell you right now, we don't all come dressed the same. We don't act the same. There's all these scenarios. Man, we're, we haven't walked the same path in life. We, we just haven't. We, we, we haven't experienced life the same. We don't have the same talents. Shoot, we don't have the same interests. We don't like the same movies. This is just truth. We're not the same people. We are vastly different. In fact, each one of us has a unique look that Jesus' grace flows through you. Amen. Each one of you has a unique you in the way that the grace that Christ has given you flows through your life. It says, as Christ apportioned it. Am I right? And so you have to get this. Um, we're all saved by the same grace, but that grace flows through our life to others differently. There are different ways that our spirituality, let's just call it that, is expressed. There's different interests. And so in Ephesians 4 verse 8, we're, we're, we're going to get this, this gifts, all right? It says, this is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. You ready? Ephesians 4.11 is going to tell us the gifts. So we're just walking down the chapter, okay? But Ephesians 4.11 is going to tell us the gifts, 11 and 12. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ might be... Here we go again. The body's growing. So that they can be built up. Leadership is given to the church, not so that we can pay leadership to do everything, but so that God's people can be equipped for the service that we are to serve in, for the works we are to do, so that the body of Christ may be built up. So, so they need us to grow. And Starla said this, and I thought it was so true. She goes, so many people look at the pastors as like mama or daddy or grandma or granddaddy who does everything for them. And that is not the responsibility of the pastor or any ministry leader that we have here. That, that is not why the, these five-fold ministries that we're called, that, that's not why they were given. But we are to equip so that together we can accomplish more. That, that together we can all operate in our own unique grace appropriated to us by Christ so that we all function in different ways but to accomplish one purpose. This is where we're heading. Church leadership is not given just so I can do everything. Guys, I'm just going to tell you, if me and Starla have to do everything, my goodness, we're not going to accomplish very much. Because we're limited. We're limited in our gift sets. We're limited in our abilities. We're limited in our time. We're limited with our resources. There's all these different things we're limited in. I hear people say this all the time. Man, I'm going to tell you, pastor, pastors are the best delegators in the world. Oh, man, it's so true. It's so true. I learned. I've watched my father my whole life. And so it, it, it's just so true. It's true because our goal is to help you to become what the church needs. Because as we partner with you, the church becomes stronger and more is accomplished. That's how this thing works. 
That's how it operates. There's a difference between doing something and becoming something. There, there's seasons by which you just have to do something. This is true. There's things in the church that isn't who I am, but I just have to do. There's things that, there's, as a believer, this works for every single one of us. Then there are some people who take the possession of that thing that they do and they become it. It's different, right? They become it. Uh, Starla's story is that when she was a young teenager, her youth pastor was trying to put together a youth group and they wanted to have a youth band. And so he just kind of walked up to Starla one day and said, hey, um, do you think that you could play the piano? So I was like, sure, I could try. And she said, the only thing that I could do was hold a chord one at a time. She said, we went up there and we would worship our socks off. And it sounded terrible, but we loved every minute of it. But see, there was a moment by which this was just something that Starla was doing. But today she has became a worship leader. Why? Because she took possession of what the Lord allowed her to do, and she became it. Do you see the difference? You have Dr. Dave. Um, you're here. Dr. Dave, he, he loves to study the Word of God. I mean, he just loves it. He loves to talk about it. And this love to study the Word of God and the love to talk about it turned him into telling people about it. That then turned him into being a teacher, which turned him into being one of the men who come to this church and who constantly are teaching us in the Word. And if you'll talk to Dave now, he will tell you, I love teaching. You have to love teaching to be on the radio all day teaching, to come to church and teach classes in the morning and evening and do it too. You have to just love it. Why? Because he became what he was asked to do. Do you see the difference? There's just this difference in all of this. There is an apportioned grace given by Christ on my life that's different than the grace that's on your life. It saves us all the same. But it flows differently through us. And God has put us together so that as each ligament does its own part, we are supported and we're stronger and we're able to grow. We're able to increase. And I want you, my goal is that you become who you are to be. I want, in fact, I would tell you that I need this. I need, the church needs you to become it so that our church can be more effective where we are today. Each one of us has a grace that makes us all stronger. It's powerful to me how it works, but that requires that we all submit ourselves to his plan. Here it is, that we submit ourselves to this. It's not do whatever you want whenever you want it's come, or like some people are like, I'm going to come whenever I want, and I'm going to, I'm going to help serve whenever I want. You're like, you know, I, I'm just going to show up at church. Oh, I'm going to help you, pastor, do this, but, you know, I can't get there till you know, 11, 15. Uh, no, it's not how it works, people. I'm just going to be real honest with you. What if my hand worked 60% of the time? I'd be really happy that I still had a hand. But it... It would not take me to my full potential because it couldn't. This is how this works. I'm not getting on to you to show up early, but I am. <laughs> Good to see you, Peggy. Every week. <laughs> Every week. What I'm telling you is in order for us to be perfected, we have to be together. We have to be committed, not just me, but all of us. We all, we all have to do this. And so I'm going to end. Starla, you can come up here. I, I, I hear some people say this every now and then, that I know God wants me to do something. But, you know, I'm not the Apostle Paul, Pastor. I'm not, I'm not Timothy or Peter. And I would look at you and I'd say, you know what? You're right. You're not. You're not Augustine. You're not Martin Luther. You're not Amy Simple McPherson. You're not Catherine Coleman. You're right. You're none of these people because all of these people did everything they could to fulfill the race that was set before them in the time that was apportioned to them. And their time has passed. But your time is now. Your place is here. And I would ask you, 
Would you commit yourself to being all that the Lord has for you to be while you're here? So that we could become all that God has meant us to be as a body? So that it ain't just about us, but we can touch the community around us, the city around us, so the lost could be saved. I would tell you that this is our time. I believe it with all my heart, that this is our place, and that we must serve the Lord faithfully with what he has given us. We must do that. And when we submit ourselves to where God has placed us, and commit ourselves to doing what's been asked of us, I believe the Lord will bless it. I believe he'll bless it. I don't even think you have to know what you're doing. That's crazy sounding, but I don't think that's a requirement. I think that what you have to do is submit yourself to the process and that God will teach you. Isn't that the responsibility of the Holy Spirit? That he one who teaches you all things and reminds you of these things? I believe that he'll do this. And so as a church, there's, I believe that this could be the year that we become who God wants us to be. I'm telling you, I'm, it's, this is what I'm thinking right now. It's where I'm going. I don't know everything, but I do know where we need to start. But I know that none of it is possible without your individual portion, a a portion, I can't say it right, your individually assigned grace that's on your life, partnering with the grace that's on my life parting with the grace that's on her life. It's not, I can't do it without you, is what I'm saying. It won't happen. So first, we need to get people serving in different areas. I'm just going to lay some stuff out real, real quick. This is what I think we need to begin to do, right? There's areas in the church that we need to serve. I need to put people over areas so that in the mornings I'm not running around with my head cut off trying to make everything happen. Oh, I need greeters, I need door greeters, I need ushers, I need media workers so that every single week it's not two people who do it all back there, but so that they could be rotating through the media department and sitting here and being a part of the services also. We need children's church workers so that Jessica doesn't have to be back there every single week doing everything, but that she could be a part of the service as well and that you could become, because some people love kids. Everybody's different, man. Everybody's different. Everybody, everybody likes different things. We're going to open up a nursery. We're trying to get the nursery ready. Uh, Megan's been working on it all week, trying to get it. She's going to work on it again next week. But we, what, it, what it means is we're having some babies. And so we're going to have people who come who have babies. And guess what? They're going to want some place to put their babies. Well, if we get the nursery ready, that means we need nursery workers. Right? Got all, we, got, we got maintenance stuff we need to do. People have done this for years, and you've taken it for granted. Jimmy's here today. Jimmy has taken care of the maintenance of this facility for years. But it's time for somebody else to take that from Jimmy. He's getting older, and I thank you for your service and all that you've done. And I'll give him a hammer as long as he can hold one. But it's also time for some of us to use the apportioned grace that's on our lives to partner with his. Why? Because I believe that if we'll get all this together, that we'll see the church move forward. That every week we'll see a few more people who walk in the doors. That we're going to see the baptism water flowing, people getting saved, and the church growing. Why? Because we're all working together, doing our part, growing in love. Amen. Right? This is what I'm after. This is what I want to do this year. I've got all kind of things I want to do, guys. We're, I don't know if you know, we're starting a, a youth ministry. We're start, uh, Candace is going to take over the youth ministry. Uh, Gabby and Mike are going to partner with her to help do the youth ministry. Why? Because we have a couple kids who are turned 13, and it's time. It doesn't matter that we only have two kids. One day we'll have 40 kids. But if I don't start now, I won't have nothing, right? And we need different people to partner with them. I got a class that I want to start teaching for new people when they come in for our foundations. I want us to start, I got a lot of things I want us to get on to this year. I, I want us to start a, like a car maintenance ministry. This is something that's been in our heart for a long time. I want us to reach out to single parents and to seniors in the community around us. And I want us to give them free oil changes. We have two huge carports in the back. We got men and women that know how to do it. All we have to do is just kind of reach out and begin to do these things. We can do that once a month. 
We can take care of some people. I want us to start a food bank again. Why you want to start a food bank again? Well, it's always in my heart. I'm not talking a food bank that touches one or two families here or there. I'm talking a food bank that can feed hundreds every month. Like, I believe we can do this. What does that mean? That means there's an apportioned grace on somebody's life who's going to partner with us because it's a beast to start these ministries. It's a, it's a huge commitment. But there has to be people who partner with us to make these things come into reality. I want to begin to remodel or build something with this facility. What does that mean? That means we all have to partner together. Put our monies together so that this facility can become what we need it to do to accomplish the task that we feel the Lord has for us while we're here. There's a lot of things I want to do this year, guys. I'm excited about it. But the first step is that we all get on board. That we all partner together. So, are you guys ready for this year? I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it. Will you guys pass out communion? We're going to take communion together as a church. Communion is this time that the Lord promises that he will be with us. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Everybody say remembrance. The most powerful thing about that to me is that word remember does not mean to think back upon. It is not recollection. But to remember in this context means that the Lord is going to rejoin, remember. Thank you. He says that I'm going to remember myself with you. That there's times by which we feel separated because of sin and distant from the Lord. And the Lord said, I will wipe that sin away. I will join with you again. And you can remember with me. Do you guys remember the man at the cross? He looks over at Jesus. He rebukes the sinner on the far side. Says, how dare you talk to him this way? And he looks at Jesus and says, Lord, remember me. Why? Because he was saying, I've been rejected by everybody my whole life. I'm an embarrassment to my family. I've been on this cross because I am a nuisance to society. Everybody has cast me out. But what I want, Jesus, is to become a part of who you say you are. Because I believe that you are the king of the Jews. I believe that you're going to heaven. And then Jesus is going to turn and look at him to say, I tell you that today you will be with me in paradise. What are we talking about here? We're talking about when we take communion. This is the body. This is the blood. And God says, in that moment, I am with you. I am there. Removing the wrong, bringing it back into repentance and back into relationship with me. I'm rejoining. I'm remembering myself with you. Amen? And so Jesus stood before the 12 disciples and he took the wine. He says, this is the wine. It represents my blood. It takes away the sins of the world. And he had some bread. He says, this is the bread. It represents my body. It is broken for you. And he took the bread and he broke it. Everybody break it. Woo! Amen. Father, I want to thank you for this. It's your stripes were for my healing. For the healing of every man and woman who's here, who's been sick over the past few weeks, who's sick today. It's for broken relationships. It's for broken marriages. It's for broken finances. That you are here to redeem us and mend us and make us whole. And Father, that your blood is for my sins. That you wash them away to never return again. Amen. Sing for us, darling. You are worthy of it all. You are
today. You have given to us joy and gladness. Lord, no matter what comes our way, you're in the middle of it. And for that, I thank you this day. I ask you, Lord, to touch those that have the offer to give. Bless them, oh God. Those that don't have, I pray that you supply the need. Lord, we thank you this day. You're an awesome God. You care about us. You love us. You meet every need, oh God, and for that we thank you. We glorify your name for all that you've done today. Go in each and every one of the homes. Lord, supply those needs. We'll give you praise for all things. We ask it in thy name. Amen. Thank you all for coming. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you.